Greetings, friends, and welcome to another Ministry of the Victory Hour, brought to you by the Lord's people at Clavel Assembly in Foster, Rhode Island. ClavelAssembly.com. That's our website. My email, info at ClavelAssembly.com. Write to me. Let me know what you think. You want help, spiritual guidance? You want to complain about something I've said? Or you just want help understanding a particular doctrine? Or you really don't know whether you belong to Christ or not? You've had doubts about the genuineness of your salvation? I, look, no matter what the issue is, um, I'm willing to help. And uh, I'm willing to defend what we believe. But I'm not in the business of just answering everybody in their complaints when they've already made up their mind. They don't want the truth. I just can't waste my time on that. So if you're sincere, you can sincerely think I'm wrong. That's fine. As long as I feel that you're sincere in that, then I'm, I'm happy to talk. But we want to be a help. This is a Christian ministry. So you want to contact me, info at clavelassembly.com. Our website is clavelassembly.com. Our meetings are at 7 Plainfield Pike in Foster, Rhode Island, 10 o'clock in the morning on Sunday and 6 o'clock in the evening on Sunday. And you'll find me there, preaching and teaching, God willing, if all goes as normally planned. <laughs> all right, so Jim Gallagher here. Um, so I want to, this week, I'm going to see if I can finalize this little, very, very, very mini-series on election. And I had one more verse to go over in Ephesians chapter 1. And rather than review what's been said, I'm just going to jump into verse 11, which is the last verse I didn't get to, because I want to get to the conversion of the Apostle Paul. Because if ever there was a picture of the doctrine of election to salvation by a sovereign God, how can you not see it in the conversion of Saul of Tarsus? And we're going to look at that. Well, before we do, let's finish Ephesians 1, verse 11. Let me read it for you. Well, you know, I should read verse 10 for the context because we're jumping in the middle of a sentence. And even that is a continuation of a sentence. But um, he writes in verse 10 that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ. And this would happen at the appointed time in which that administration of reality would transpire. All things come together in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. In whom, now I read verse 10 really just to show you, yes, yeah, we're continuing to talk about Christ. In whom also, <coughs> excuse me, speaking of Christ, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance. Now, we doesn't mean all the people on the face of the earth. He's writing to the believers at Ephesus. The context is the Christian community. The immediate context is the Christian community in Ephesus, because this was a letter written to them. But quite obviously, we can extrapolate the principle to all believers in Christ. In whom we have obtained an inheritance. Through Christ, we have an inheritance. The promises made to Abraham. Well, how do the promises made to Abraham go to Gentile Christians? Because Christ is Abraham's seed, and he's the heir according to the promise. That's Bible teaching. It's not dispensational teaching, but it is Bible teaching. It's gospel preaching. It is. In whom we have, in whom also, see, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance. Not just the Jewish people that descended from Abraham and that believed on Christ. Yes, they are the Israel of God. Yes, that is a continuation of the promises given to Israel. They represent those who were very early resurrected from the dead grave of Israel. We'll explain that some other time. And then the Gentiles would be grafted in and made a part of that body in whom also we have obtained, see, not just the Jewish people, but even the Gentile people that believe on Christ. We also, in conjunction with them, 
just like Ephesians 2 and Ephesians 3, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance being predestinated. Well, the Jews are God's chosen people. They were predestinated. Well, the ones that are in Christ, yeah. And so is the case with the elect amongst the Gentiles, pe- Gentile people that believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. They are grafted into the commonwealth of Israel and become fellow citizens. That's the mystery of the gospel. That's the mystery of the Hebrew Messiah, the mystery of Christ. It's the gospel. And it's all based on election and predestination, just like it was for the Jewish nation, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance, salvation, citizenship in the commonwealth of Israel, being predestinated. Uh, What's there not to understand? The problem with, with some that are watching this, you don't like it. Not that you don't like what I'm saying, though maybe you don't like what I'm saying. You don't like what God is saying. As a Christian, I need you to stop and think about that. Think about it. You can correct this problem midstream. The Christian life is all about correcting our problems midstream. We learn as we go, and we make mistakes, and we fall down. I've done it. Look, I used to teach the Jews of God's chosen people. I read the Hal Lindsey books, and I believed them when I was young. But then I grew up, and I said no. In In whom also we have obtained an inheritance being predestinated, Our destiny is predetermined by God. And why did he choose me? Why, if you're a a believer in Christ, did he choose you? I mean, if you've been predestined to this end, why? Why? You can ask the question very naturally. Why me and not that other guy? I understand the question. A little bit of humility will force you to ask that question. We weren't better than anybody else. Out of the same lump of clay, he made one vessel to honor and one vessel to dishonor. Well, the vessel that was made to honor can look at the vessel made to dishonor and say, well, why did he spare me that fate? Why did he predestined me and show mercy and forgive me and shower me with his spirit and cause me to be regenerated? by the transplanting of my heart through the Holy Spirit. Why did he do that for me? I was no better than the other guy. Hey, you're right. You're right. I wasn't, and you weren't. We came from the same lump of clay. That's the doctrine of election. But, okay, here's the question. Why? Why did he choose me? In whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated, here's why, according to the purpose of him, who worketh all things, after the counsel of his own will. Just soak in the glory of that one. Just soak in the glory. Look, the reason he predestined certain people is because it pleased him to do it. And if this upsets you, well, it's no different than Romans 9, what Paul said in in his letter to the Romans. He says, Thou wilt say unto me, Why did he yet find fault? For who hath resisted his will? In other words, men that don't come to Christ, well, they don't come to Christ because God doesn't call them and give them new hearts. So how can God blame them? God didn't do that magical work of grace on them like he did other people. So those other people didn't deserve it, true. Well, then why didn't he do it for these, the the, the rest of these people? Why didn't he choose everyone? Why did he leave these out? And what you're really asking is, why did he leave them to their own free volition and free wills? When man is left to his free will, quote-unquote, he won't choose God. That's the testimony of Scripture. There is none that seeketh after God. Okay, so they're only getting justice. That's right. But why doesn't he show mercy in them, too, instead of giving them justice? Well, Paul explains it. 
Because the question is, why doth he yet find fault with the unbelievers? Who hath resisted his will? Paul's answer, Nay, but, O oh man, who art thou that replieth against God? Shall the thing formed say to him that formed it, Why hast thou made me thus? Is that what you should do? No. Paul says, I don't know that we're really going to have time to go into the conversion of Saul of Tarsus. I may have to leave that for the next video. It comes out on Thursday. I can't squeeze that in here. And this is just too great to talk to, you know, short circuit what we're talking about here. <laughs> I'm still going to try and finish election, this very, 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 very mini series on election um, this week so we can get into the parousia, the second coming of Christ. Who that's going to take some work. You know, eschatology needs an overhaul. So there's a lot of work to do there. But why did God choose me and not the other man? Who art thou, Paul says, that replies against God? Shall the thing form say to him that formed it, Why hast thou made me thus? No, you have no right to complain. Hath not the potter power over the clay? Where the clay? He's the potter who shapes the clay, right? He owns the clay. Hath not the potter power over the clay? Of the same lump to make one vessel unto honor, and another unto dishonor. I just referenced that concept. So the vessels of honor uh, were not deserving of it. They weren't better, so God chose them because there was something, some spark of goodness into them. No, there was none that doeth good, no, not one. All right. He makes one vessel to honor, another to dishonor. What if God, now you're complaining, well, why didn't he, why didn't he do this for the other people? And then Paul says, what if God, willing to show his wrath, and to make his power known, endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction. What if God, in order to communicate to man his anger against sin, he allowed sinners to prosper and go their own way and exercise their free volitions as to God and salvation? He let them choose. Not one of them would choose him without his divine help. But what if God, willing to show his wrath and to make his power known, what if he chose to, and obviously did, endure with much long suffering the vessels of wrath who were designed for destruction in God's secret providence? And the flip side of that is, and what if God was willing that he might make known the riches of his glory? on the vessels of mercy, which he hath afore, before times, prepared unto glory. What if God wants to show his mercy on vessels of mercy, and show his wrath on vessels of wrath, that man might know who God is? Then that's his prerogative. That's what Paul says. That's why he chose us. Now, I know, in a sense, that's not why he chose us. It is why he chose us, but but, but why? But okay, that's why he chose some. But why did he choose me? I don't know the answer to the question. I certainly don't know the answer to the question of why he chose me. That even makes less sense to me. <laughs> Other than to say it pleased God to do it in His mercy. That's the only thing I can say. And I'm I'm good with that. I have no complaints against God. And that he might make known the riches of his glory and the vessels of mercy, which he had afore prepared unto glory. Even us, whom he hath called, not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles. Yes, he even in time chose to call out and predestined a remnant, of course, the predestination didn't come in time. That was an eternity past. 
But the application of that predestination to saving faith would come in time because he wasn't saving the Gentile people. He was calling out the seed of Abraham. Even us whom he hath called, not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles, as he saith also in Osi, I will call them my people which were not my people. And her beloved, which was not my beloved. And it shall come to pass that in the place where it is said unto them, Ye are not my people, there shall they be called the children of the living God. There's your doctrine of election and predestination. There's your reasoning as to why God chose some. Live with it. <laughs> Live with it. Live with it. See, back in Ephesians 1, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. That's why he did it. That we should be to the praise of his glory, who first trusted in Christ. In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, and ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. Why do Christians balk at the idea that God chose them? You don't have any problem with saying the Jews are God's chosen people? How come he can choose them? How dare we question the Almighty with our so-called logic and, and rational thinking? The nations are but a drop in the bucket to God. Man drinks in iniquity like water. Who are we to question the Almighty? Well, that's Romans 9, right? But we do know this. God is good. God is love. And everything he does is righteous and holy and good. Whether you can understand why he's doing a certain thing in all its fullness and detail doesn't matter. You know it's true. God is righteous, holy, and good, and he has a purpose for everything he's doing. But he hasn't laid out for us the purposes of everything. Some of that will unfold in time. And some, some of it not until eternity. And then you will know even as we are known. I don't know what there is not to love in this doctrine of election and predestination. When people say, well, Pastor, okay, I can see where you're getting that from in the Bible, but why do you seem so excited about it? Why, do you, why does that bring you so much joy? It still makes God seem arbitrary. Seem is the operative word there. God is not arbitrary. He has a reason, but he doesn't share all his reasons. We, we don't understand him. Remember how the Lord queried Job? Job, where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Huh? When I did this, that, and the other, were you there? Uh, well, Lord, um, no, I wasn't. Well, neither were you and I. The secret things belong to God. Now, the secrets of the Lord are revealed to them that fear him. But not all of the secrets, just certain ones that he chooses for us to know. Can't you believe and trust the Lord by faith? Isn't that the essence of what we're supposed to do as regenerated believers? Of course it is. So the question remains well, then why do you get so much blessing out of this? difficult subject. <laughs> I don't, and it's only difficult because you're still resisting it. To me, it's not difficult. Well, I can see what he says. It must be true, and it must be right. See, that makes my life free and happy. I just described what's so great about this doctrine. I just described it. You know, at the at uh, Clavel, the elders, we kind of have like a little inside joke, although we've, we've shared it with the Lord's people, but we don't talk this way with the Lord's people. We talk this way to each other. When we talk about the doctrine of election, we really talk, what we call, we call it, the Lord never called it this, but we call it the shut up doctrine. The shut up doctrine. <laughs> oh, you know, 
Maybe I don't do myself favors. Maybe I don't have the esteem of the men of the cloth that many come to expect when ministers are taught to put on airs so that they would be feared in their flesh. Nah, I'm not going to do that. God is to be feared. Sometimes people should tremble at the men of God because they carry his truth to them. But look, I'm just a regular person like anybody else. I do get something out of this doctrine. We called it the shut up doctrine, really because of Romans 9, what I just read. Nay, but who art thou that replies against God, Paul said. In other words, how can he yet find fault? For who has resisted his will? How come he chose them? But if I'm not chosen, how can he find fault with me? Because he didn't regenerate me so that I would receive him. So how can he find fault with me? See, basically charging God with injustice, which is what many of you are doing as I'm talking. Well, I don't know many. But I'm sure there are some. If we went to the Christian population at large, yeah, it would be many. Who tunes into this YouTube uh, postings of me? I, I don't know. Maybe they're more friendly than unfriendly. Or, you know, whatever. I shut down the comments because there were plenty of unfriendly people. There was lots of friendly people, too. But I, I, I can't. The, the naysayers and the attackers of Christ, I feel obligated to answer. And I couldn't. I can't, can't take my time to answer all the YouTube complaints because people don't like what I'm saying. So I shut the comments down because I feel a moral obligation to answer them. If I'm going to give them a platform and a microphone to contradict what the Lord has laid in my heart, I have to answer that. So I had to shut the comments down. I, I was hopeful to maybe be able to keep them open, but from the very beginning, I thought it probably won't last. And it didn't. <laughs> it didn't. No, that's the way it goes. But yeah, I get something out of this. You see, the doctrine of election and predestination have taught me that I have an obligation to believe God even when God doesn't make sense to me. I have an obligation. Because when I first came to the doctrine of predestination, I kept you know, trying to resist it. And then I said, but it seems true. It seems true. That's what it's saying here. That's what it's saying there. That's what it's saying here. I couldn't escape it until finally I had to say, Lord, I, I this is true doctrine. You do predestinate your people to eternal salvation. And not because you foresee the goodness in their hearts to receive Christ if, I, if, the, if they're given half a chance. No. Same lump of clay as the unbelievers. No advantage that merited God's election of them. I said, so Lord, I can see that. So I believe it. But Lord, I, it does seem like then why didn't you just do that for everyone? And it just seems arbitrary that you chose me because I know I didn't deserve it. And I can't explain that. So Lord, I believe this doctrine and I believe it to be righteous and good and purposeful, but I don't see how that's true. So, Lord, I'm just not going to be able to talk about it much because I don't know how to defend it, but, Lord, I know it's what you've said. And therefore, I believe it. And I declare that it is righteous and purposeful, though I have no idea how. I actually prayed a prayer like that to the Lord. That was my heart to the Lord. And that's what I thought would happen. And as I've told you before, it was, just, it was less than a week. It was a matter of days. I thought I'd, you know, I believe it, but now I'm not going to talk about it much. But within days, I couldn't shut my mouth about it. <laughs> and the Lord just gave me utter peace. Not that he gave me a full understanding or an explanation of my question. I realized I didn't need it. It's no different than Abraham. And I always use this example. God said to Abraham, take your only son, the son that you love, Isaac, and bring him up 
to the mount, to the place that I will show you, and offer him as a burnt offering unto me there. And Abraham had to think to himself, The Lord's promise was that in Isaac shall thy seed be called, Abraham. In Isaac I had my old age, beyond years when we could have children, and now Isaac's grown up some. Now the Lord's saying to kill him as a sacrifice. But he said to me, In Isaac shall thy seed be called. Why kill Isaac? And Isaac have no seed, and Isaac didn't have any children yet. Then the promise falls flat in his face. It seemed crazy. It seemed like God was going to make it impossible for him to fulfill his promise to Abraham. So even though Abraham didn't understand what God was doing, and God didn't make sense, the next day, early in the morning, Abraham got up and gathered some young men to help him and his son Isaac. And they went off to find that place where God would appoint Abraham to sacrifice his son. Abraham acted by faith when he couldn't understand. And I realize that's what God is asking us to do. I think God could actually have taught us why he's chosen certain individuals, but he chose not to, that we might be the sons of Abraham by faith, the way Abraham believed God, and that faith, when God didn't make sense, was accounted to him for righteousness. He asks the same of us, if we are going to bear the title of the seed of Abraham which we do if we're in Christ. But that must mean that we're willing to believe God when God doesn't make sense. Is that you? If that's not you, you need to ask yourself, then how am I the seed of Abraham? See the point? See, the doctrine of election and predestination teaches us to humble ourselves before God We don't have to have the answers as to the why of things falling out the way that they do. And this is what bothers Christians so much. Like problems and difficulties and trials come into our lives. I'm running out of time. This will spill over a little bit in the next time. But, you know, we difficulties come in our life that seem no rhyme or reason. No one's being saved from it. No one's being encouraged from it, it doesn't seem. It's just a bad thing that happens to us, and it won't go away, and it just makes it harder for us to live our Christian lives. And why is God doing this? We don't know. Those kind of things are always going to happen. So what do you do with it? You rush to the Christian bookstore and buy a, a, a book. Why bad things happen to good people? No. Here's what you do. You trust God and you worship him in spite of your lack of understanding, and he will strengthen you. This is what he wants from us, and it it changes your life when you begin to see it that way, not just in the matter of predestination, but in all these crosses we have to bear in this life and in this world. Your life as a Christian will become so much freer and easier when you realize You don't have to defend God and all that he does. If he's done it, he has his reasons. And you're at peace with that. I know the world won't accept that. Too bad for them. There'll come a day that they'll reject, they'll, 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 um, regret. That's the word I want. (laughs) Reject. They'll regret taking that position against God. They will meet their maker and give an account. And so shall you and I. I hope that we can stand before him in faith and say it's because of Christ that I believe. In spite of the things that have happened to me, I believe. 
Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Look, I've got to go. Time's up. Jim Gallagher reminding you in the words of our blessed Lord and Savior, ye shall know the truth, and the truth, if you believe it, shall make you free.